I'd like to introduce Dr. Amina al Yassen, who is a clinical fellow at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. And Amina has been involved with the Nori community in the UK for about a year and a half. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really, really excited to be a part of the conference this year. I think as doctors, we never learn more than when we are surrounded by people who know so much more about the condition than we do. And that's why I've really learned so much by being here this weekend. And also, I'm so excited as to what this will mean for the community of people with Nori, both in the UK and the USA and around the world coming from here. I know that I've been given the slot right after lunch. <laughs> and in medicine, there's something which we call the carb coma. And so I just thought we would start by having a little activity to shake things up and to just make sure that we're a little bit awake. So I think there's a mic somewhere. Mark's got a mic. And what I'd really like is if we could just go around the room and if everybody could just say, maybe in max like one sentence, what their wish list would be for doctors and researchers about Nori. So what is your wish? What do you want people to focus on? What is important to you? Is it the hearing? Is it the vision? Is it the vascular issues? What is it the social issues? Is it the mental health? What is it? If everyone can just go around the room and in one sentence, it would be so good to have that on record. Thank you. Yeah, um, hi, yeah, this is Mike. Um, and I guess my biggest wish would be um, just looking into the hearing. You know, I have cochlear implants, I do really well with them, but, um, you know, they're, it's not natural hearing. And if, especially for future generations, if they're able to preserve that, it would be really helpful. Okay, what do you think? You, did you get the question? What, what's important about Nori that you'd like to learn more about or understand more about? I have... Future, what would you like to hear more about? I think the hearing, right? My, my hearing. Yeah, I think the hearing is what we're most concerned, losing more hearing, how hearing. we can deal with that. Yeah. Parents are allowed to answer too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, for us in our house right now, it's behaviors, autism, anxiety, dealing with those sorts of things, coupled with the the vision loss. That's what worries me. Yeah. Most. With with communication. Yeah. 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 In our home, it is the hearing loss coupled yeah. with the behavior um, changes yeah. as they grow older. Um, because the behavior changes to change as well. That's really helpful. Thank you. So we're hearing lots about hearing and behavior so far. I would say hearing also, and also as um, our children with developmental disabilities mm. age, um, what opportunities are available. I, I, I don't know that that's a doctor's, but it's important. We're all working but together. But it's just something yeah. that's of great concern as we age and they age and we know they're going to need help the rest of their lives. But that's hearing a, on a medical. Uh, Thank you, Jana. Such an important point. Hi, I'm a grandparent of a child. Oh. So for me, I would like to see eventually him, he, him be able to see and also the cognitive development, that he really be able to function. Sure, so vision and cognitive development. Mm -hmm. Okay. For us, our biggest would be the hearing loss right now and hearing aids. Hearing. Calvin. My biggest wish is um, to have my, my hearing back to where it was when I was younger. Mm. Um, yeah, that's probably a big thing for me. Yeah, thank you, Calvin. Your turn. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to be original and not original at the same time. 
Yeah. Because also for me, uh, the number one wish is that there's more attention for the hearing. Uh, the vision is not that much my concern. I'm used to being blind. Yeah. Um, the second thing that I want to put my attention to, or that I want to put into attention, is that Nori has possible problems in the retro reproductive system, and mm -hmm. that it has an influence on sexuality, which is often not talked about. Yeah. And for some people in some generations, especially teenage, it might be interesting to have that brought yeah. to light as well. Thanks for being brave enough to bring that up. And I think that is a really important subject. We'll touch on that a little bit today. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, it's working. Yes, I, I won't be as original as my son. So, <laughs> so for me, the important part are the same as my son. So the hearing loss and uh, the rest is sure. quite important. Sure, thank you. I think for us, the uh, hearing loss. Yeah, that's such a common theme, isn't it? Yes. Um, also, hearing loss, and our son has, you know, some delays in communication, and so, which I think extends to the behavioral, so that's one concern for us, so, or several, I guess. Yeah, and then the, the reproductive aspect of it as well, you know. We think about it. Yeah. We don't really communicate it to other people. So, yeah. You know, that is something, you know, because I think it also goes along with the uh, uh, vascular issues. Absolutely. So, you know. The thing about why it's so important that you're brave enough to talk about that is when we're talking about rare diseases, each and every single person matters. Like, each and every single person is like 2% of the world population, you know, of people who we know. And every time an issue is brought up, that's when you start joining the dots. And there are things like, for example, erectile dysfunction, which are common in the population. And so many people would think maybe it's just, you know, a common thing. But it's only when people start talking about it that you realize that it's more prevalent in Nori than it is in others. So could it be as a result of the condition? And that's when people start thinking about it. So it's so important any symptoms that are experienced for us to really have a think about whether this is related to Nori or not. So thanks. Um, I think for us, it would be the hearing loss and also the reproductive um, and uh, mental health, better access to mental health provision from early years. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, I think for us, the first is um, anxiety, and then the second will be hearing loss. He so far he has perfect normal like hearing. There's no problem, but uh, always a concern, you know, because there almost every like a normal patient they have a hearing uh, loss. So, um, you know, he has like a functional vision, pretty much okay. So, yeah. Sure. So we don't have any concern in that aspect. Thank you. Uh, definitely for us, it's um, vision. Um, our son has pretty good hearing. Um, we think he has some actual hearing sensitivities. Um, but I also, you know, my big dream is for him to, to be able to see me one day. So uh, that to me, and I don't think it's impossible. I think it's just something that the technology has to to grow and to mature. So I think for me, definitely the vision is uh, the primary. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so I want it all for my child. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like when he was first born, I had a TV guy come out and say, oh, your son is just blind. Oh, you're so lucky. And then as he started getting hearing loss, I'm like, wow. And then um, some of the, you know, now as an adult and some of the other vascular issues as far as reproduction started, you know, being a problem. So, but I guess probably of all of those, I would probably say hearing has been the most devastating. I don't, I don't see him. I was waiting. He might add his two cents when he comes in. But for him, probably hearing has been the most devastating. But now that he's um, a young adult, I would say below the belt is also very um, important. Thank you. Dan, you go. <clears throat> okay. So, um, my wish would be well, okay, so first of all, like, 
like most people, I think I think for me it's the the hearing first. So, um, I, I I wish that they would they would research on um, on the hearing especially because I I know people like to research on the eyes, but um, for the majority of people with noria, that's not the biggest problem. Um, I think my second would be that we need to figure out what exactly it does. If there are if there are reproductive issues, we need to know about that. If there are vascular issues, we have to know about that. And I think we need to, I don't know that we know all that. So before we start doing, you know, future things with the eyes, I think we have to figure out what exactly it does throughout the entire body. So That's a really, really important point. Thank you so much. And yeah, with many of these Many conditions in the beginning, it's just the blindness that's known about, and with time and with increasing patient numbers, you start to find out more and more. And it's so important to find out how it affects the whole body, just as you said. Thank you. Um, for, for us in our house, I think the hearing loss is probably the biggest um, concern. Our son is three right now and hasn't experienced any hearing loss, but obviously it's a concern for the future. Um, you know, we've pretty much adjusted to the fact that Sean has no um, vision, except for maybe a little bit of light perception. I think we're, we're sort of at peace with that. We're still hopeful that maybe, you know, something will come along, some sort of um, amazing treatment for the vision loss. But, you know, the hardest thing to think about in the future is if Sean starts to lose that hearing and how that would potentially you know, affect the family. Sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go out, way off on a tangent. Um, uh, to sum it up really quickly, leave your ego at the door. Um, we experienced some pretty uh, heavy backlash from doctors in Canada that either didn't... Th they didn't know what they were doing with yeah. this, uh, but thought they did, or said they did, but didn't actually. Um, up to you know, even government organizations saying, no, they said they can do it, so you got to do it here. Um, and I mean, even down to going to you know a, a walk-in clinic uh, where you have to say, oh, this is why uh, my son's blind. This is why my son is acting this way. If you know, if we have to explain it, just just take it, and you know, I'm, uh, and it's been a joy to be here because I I haven't seen any of that here. Thank you, um, but there has been some instances where we've had to explain, but the doctor's very apprehensive that we know something that they don't, because they've been in school for they they went to school for eight you know eight to twelve years or whatever it was. So yeah, that's. And even down to parents, if you have to explain it, don't, don't, ha don't uh, get your back up that they don't know. Um, yeah, that's the way it is. Not that all doctors are like that. We <laughs> there are some very lovely doctors in Canada, but a couple have uh, we met a couple that that have a lot of ego, and weren't allowed to weren't willing to hear us out. So um, I think from. Um, our perspective, we spent a lot of time managing the ocular side of things, and that has been a priority for us. Mackenzie's only six, and, and the hearing loss isn't really on our radar yet. I realize that down the road that will likely be the case because of that du dual sensory loss. Um, um, and at that point, um, that may be more priority. I, I mean, I also think of the future down the road, as Jan has said, and I know I've expressed it on the Facebook group, uh, Facebook group that um, I have a lot of uh, concerns about down the road at some point I won't be here and at some point my husband won't be here and 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 what then um, so I guess like Mary too there's a laundry list right we all have that laundry list that um, we want the best and and uh, so yeah hearing number one or sorry visual number one at this point for me and and I know down the road the hearing will yeah. kick in Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. And I mean, it's, you know, it, it's no secret. I mean, as a doctor, I tell you, we, most doctors don't know about most rare diseases. And you know, that's why they're rare. But the important thing there is just to acknowledge your limitations and to say, you know, I don't know. And you probably know more than I do about this. But let's find a way to find out together. 
And there are a few slides at the end, which is a project we did between patients and parents, sorry, parents and doctors to try and work on some guidelines for working respectfully with uh, families with rare diseases. And I really hear what you're saying about that. Yeah, uh, for me, my little boy, uh, again, he's young. I'm concerned about vision, obviously. Yeah. That's, that's my boy right there. I don't remember his name, but I, 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 I have a wish that someday he might see me. Uh, my face at least, you know. Uh, also hearing loss, we, we started testing his hearing and there's some abnormality there already. So it's, it's not that bad, but it's already on our radar. So we, we, we want to find something, you know, uh, hopefully in his lifetime that gets better and he doesn't have to deal with all the problems with the hearing aids and all that stuff. And Lastly, socially, uh, I'm, the way my brain is wired, I'm, I'm used to think way ahead of things, so I'm yeah. not able to. My wife is just one step at a time. I, I think him in college right now. So again, I'm, I'm with these guys right here. My, I'm, I'm concerned about the, the reproduction part, you know, having a social life, having a, as normal as he can, you know. So the whole package, like somebody said, yeah. we're under. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my son is nine years old. Uh, we still haven't suffered uh, hearing loss. So, of course, uh, our, the vision is something that is uh, well, totally blind, really hoping that there is some solution or some uh, thing. One more thing is about being independent. That's something that we really want to improve about him. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm horrible at public speaking, by the way, so this has taken a lot out of me to do this. But uh, basically, I think right now, the thing that we're worried about is um, that he is slightly nonverbal. He's working on it every day, but um, we want him to communicate better. And I think that because he doesn't have a good grasp of it, he gets very upset. And um, you can just tell there's a lot going on in there, and he just wants to get it out and has a hard time doing that. And I think that that causes anxiety and a lot of things for him that we'd like to work on. Um, so yeah, that right now, that's my that's the thing I'd like to work on is getting him to be able to let us know what's wrong or what he'd like. And um, that's the current issue. For the future, um, hearing is the thing that I want to be able to work on because I think that that's only going to make um, things harder in, in communication and stuff if he can't hear what we're talking about and be part of the group. Um, so I think that I'm hopeful that that's the next, the next thing that we fix. So. Thank you. Is that everybody? Uh, I, I believe I am rounding it out here. So uh, like Mayor, oh, and I think Nathan just came back. Well, here, how, about, how about we let Nathan chime in here? Oh, buddy. <laughs> All right, here's your mic. I heard everything. Uh, I, I, uh, is this thing on? Ah, she doesn't sound very sensitive. Um, yeah, I heard everything she said. Um, I, I, I stream. I was streaming it, um, but I, I didn't hear everything um, that the other speaker said. But I did hear what she said, so I'm guessing that they were talking about like similar things. Um, oh, okay. Well. Oh, sorry. Um. I think, I mean, me, yeah, hearing's important, yeah, vision's important. Would it be great to have those two things, you know, vision and hearing, perfectly, yes. But we we live in a world, you know, and sometimes, you know, sometimes we just have to take what's given to us. We don't have an option. And um, as uh, much faith as I do have in science, I think that, I think that we um we just have to take what we have. Um, but I think it would be great, you know, if they could figure out, you know, a way to get 
give people vision. I mean, hey, even if it were partial vision, you know, um, I think it'd be better than, than nothing. And I mean, as far as the hearing, um, I, I think if they could figure out a way to prevent it, um, that would be great. But I mean, we're talking about maybe 25, 30 years down the road. And um, I don't know. I mean, I guess what I really want to see is I want to see I want to see the reproductive issue straightened out. I mean, I think for for adults, it's it's a it's an issue. Um, you know, I mean, we're normal adults. You know, we want to have a normal life. We want to date whoever we want to date, and all that. And to be uh, unable to reproduce is, um, yeah, it's just it's it's frustrating. Um, uh, and um, just like you know, how can we? How can the people that want to get the surgery? How can we afford it? You know, like uh, a lot of insurances don't cover it. So, the video you're looking at anywhere from twenty thousand to seventy thousand dollars, mostly for the anesthesia. Um, and so yeah, that's what I'd like to see done. Um, mainly the reproductive. Uh, I think you know. I don't know. I mean, the hearing is important. Oh. Okay, the hearing is important, but uh, but but I know that I'm not going to get it back, and uh, I I think that we should focus on the things that can be corrected, and the reproductive thing is something that can be corrected. So yeah. Okay. Sorry. No, that was really helpful. <laughs> yeah. All is right. that well, everyone? That yeah, that is everyone except for me. So the last item would be I I sort of want it all like Mary, but I do want like Dan to have some idea of what we're in for because we keep hearing about these things and they're coming up in the community on the forums and that's at least a seed or a starting point, but then we need some type of statistics and some type of clinical backing to actually have conversation with somebody else. Sure. Every time I see my son put his hand up to his ear, I start worrying about his hearing loss, I see his behaviors and I start worrying about, okay, is there a bit of autism here? I don't know what the full bag is that I'm getting with the disease. And I would like to understand that. And then I want all my things. I want his hearing to stay there. I want some vision. So, yeah, and I want him to be able to have a girlfriend to go have a family down the road and do all <laughs> the things that you expect to do. Right? So, yeah, that's uh, about sure. it. And I think that's, that's us. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think, I mean, it took a bit longer than I thought it would. But, no, no, but, but. But to me, really, this has been the most important 25 minutes of the conference, because after all, that's what matters. And you know, we can set priorities in our universities and in our hospitals, but if they're not aligned with what you want, then what's the point? So thank you so much for sharing that. What I'm going to be talking about today is a study that um, we conducted in the UK, looking at 22 people with non disease and asking them 102 questions each and examining them where possible to really try and understand what the sort of concerns that they had and what the medical conditions that they had was. This sort of follows on by a study by Smith et al. in 2012 where they did something similar in America and I think they included 56 patients there. I think many of it was a notes review and I'm sure, I think some patients were seen face to face as well. But um, yeah, so our study adds to that. And although it's not huge numbers, there aren't huge numbers. And I think every sort of additional person who we have understood more about really counts. So the study team was myself, and I did this during a six month fellowship in genetics and pediatrics at Great Ormond Street Hospital. I was supervised by Professor Maria Bitnaglinjic, who you may have heard her name quite a few times over the last two days. And I'll tell you a little bit more about her work at the end. And also we had lots and lots of patient engagement, patient involvement, family involvement with Wendy, who you heard from just before lunch. So we're going to talk about the study, what the aims were, which methods we used, some of our interesting findings. We're also going to talk about just through speaking to families, what the journey from diagnosis to management looked like, and what we think in the UK the good care should look like. So of course there are lots of, there are always going to be lots of differences in different countries with how conditions are managed, but we're going to talk about how we think good care should look like, at least in the UK. And I think that will have hopefully important lessons for everybody. And of course there'll be a chance for questions and um, 
I've bribed a few people to take Anthony out of the room at that moment. So let's see if that happens. <laughs> So yeah, very much our objectives in the study were to understand more about the characteristics of Nori disease, and in particular, the patterns of hearing loss. We wanted to understand whether in our patients that we saw, if we could find a relationship between the gene change the person had and the particular sort of constellation of symptoms which they experienced, which you've heard about today, and that's called the genotype-phenotype correlation. Throughout today's... Um, talk, I'm going to very much pitch this as if it's a new family with not much previous understanding of genetics or Nori. So I'm sorry if it's simple, but I think it's probably best that we all start off at the, you know, at this, in the same place. So the reason why the study is important is, as I said, every single patient adds so much to our understanding of Nori. But also, if we ever want to think about therapy-focused research, if we ever want to think about gene therapy and treatment, then we really need to understand the natural history of the condition, which means how does it, when does it start, how does it progress, what exactly happens, what does it affect, so that we know even if we do get a treatment one day, when is it going to need to be given, who can it be given to, and how are we going to know that it's worked? And this study very much builds on the previous work and research of so many others who you've spoke, heard from in the last two days. Our methods were that, first of all, we had to go through a laborious process of um, ethical approval. They're very, very hot on that in the UK. So of the six-month fellowship, it took four months to get them to say it's okay to do this research. And then two months running around like a headless chicken on trains, visiting families all throughout the country. Uh, the participants were invited through the hospital patient list, through the Nori Disease Foundation membership, and through the Facebook group. And we recruited 22 affected participants, three of whom were from Europe. And everybody undertook a very detailed questionnaire and interview. And those where it was face-to-face, uh, -face, which was, I think, 20 out of the 22, they also had external examinations. And our findings... So the first thing to say about our findings is there's nothing here which is a breakthrough. There's nothing here which particularly may be nothing that you already know. But I think it's still important to just bring the same important messages over and over again. So our sample included people aged 1 to 71. But this is a very, very important point. Our median age, so our average age, was 18.5. So we have a very young sample here which means that some of our things may be underestimated because you may expect some things to develop with age. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Of the 22 people we met, 19 had a diagnosis of Nori, two had a diagnosis of FEVR, and one had a diagnosis of Nori, but we think probably has FEVR. One of the 22 was a female with Nori who was um, affected and as I said, 19 were from the UK and three were from Europe. So the first thing is, how did the people come to be diagnosed in the first place? So the youngest person we had diagnosed was still in pregnancy, 35 weeks in utero. So pregnancy is 40 weeks. So this was a baby who was diagnosed five weeks before birth. And the reason was because uh, they had an older brother who had Nori. And when they were doing serial ultrasound scans throughout pregnancy, they started seeing on the ultrasound some of those eye changes that we heard about earlier today. And so although that's not a confirmation that the child has Nori, it did make it quite likely that they did. The oldest person we had diagnosed was 65, and this was a grandfather who had been, um, had been visually impaired throughout his life, but he was only diagnosed as having Nori when his grandson was born and had a genetic confirmation, so the doctors then went back and um, diagnosed him. This thing about the prenatal ultrasound uh, diagnosing Nori disease, th this has also been recently published in a paper in China, and they looked at um, a pregnancy at 22 weeks out of 40, and the eye looked normal. 
And at 31 weeks out of 14, it looked normal again. And at 36 weeks, they started to see the changes associated with Nori disease. So they, their conclusion is that it might be towards the end of pregnancy that things start to happen. However, I would say that that is a very gross measure. So ultrasounds are not very detailed. And so you never know that smaller changes may have started to occur much before that. So it's just something to know out of interest, but not likely to be something that you can really, really firmly hold on to as a diagnostic tool. In terms of genetics, I'm going to explain this slide because it's, um, it's a table which shows the genetic mutations of the people in our sample where that is known. I'm not gonna read them all out, but what I will say is that every family in our sample had a completely different mutation to other families. Where you had um, mutations that were the same, they were either in one family in which you had two siblings, so you would expect the genetic mutation to be the same, or in one in which it was the grandfather and the grandson who had the same mutation. Other than that, most of the mutations were different. So there are some genetic conditions like cystic fibrosis in which most people with cystic fibrosis will have exactly the same gene change. But there are some conditions like Nori in which the gene is long, so it's like around 400 letters long, and any of those letters could have changed to cause nori, and so most people will have different ones, and you will have people who have the same one, but um, you, most people will have different ones. One family had something which we call a contiguous deletion, which I will explain in another slide, but that is when it's not just the nori gene that was deleted, so removed, but the genes that were on either side of it were affected as well. The other thing to say is that, which was quite an interesting uh, finding that again has been reported before, is remember I told you about the grandfather and the grandson? And so they both had the same genetic change exactly, but the grandfather had been born visually impaired, but he had some vision such that he could read a newspaper if it was held really close to his eyes. And with time, at around the age of 50, that deteriorated such that he still could see movements, but he, you know, he still had some light perception. Whereas the grandson, and, and the grandson was born with no light perception from the very beginning. And so the grandfather was given a diagnosis of FEVR, and the grandson was given a diagnosis of Nori, but they had the same genetic change. And that's interesting because it means that we can't, in some cases, we can think, oh, this is a gene that has you know, like changed the particular bonds, which has changed the protein structure, more likely to be severe. But in many cases, actually, just looking at the gene change by itself cannot really predict how severe someone is going to be affected. However, over lunch, we were talking about this, and we think that there is probably so much more to be learned about this. So genes sometimes like influence the effect of each other. Sometimes genes themselves make you more predisposed, like more at risk of having some environmental factors affect you. And so we think that this is probably quite complicated and there's a lot more to learn about this. But definitely Nori and FEVR can sometimes be caused by the same mutation. And so that makes it much trickier to make these genotype, phenotype correlations which we spoke about. For the interest of time, I'm just going to skip through like the, yes, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. I will skip to that right now. So um, I was going to talk a little bit about what does a missense mutation mean and what does a frame shift mutation mean. But I think for the interest of time, We'll make sure that these slides get sent out so that'll be on them. But for the interest of time, we'll move on to the question of the woman and our results. Okay. So as you know, we all have, in our, our bodies are made up of millions and millions of cells and each cell has got 23 pairs of chromosomes. So our chromosomes are like the little bits of material which carry all of our genes on them. Okay, so everybody's got 22 pairs of chromosomes and then 
Women have an X and an X, so they have two Xs, and men have an X and a Y. But females, their body doesn't need two Xs in every single cell, so it will always shut one of the Xs off. That is called X inactivation, okay? So if, you're, if there's a female who's a carrier, that means one of her Xs will be completely normal, and the other X will have the nori change on it. You would expect that the body would switch off half of those and half of those, and so she'd have enough norin protein being made, and she would not be affected. However, if for some reason the body switched off more of the, health, the normal healthy Xs and kept more of the nori Xs switched on, you can then end up having somebody who, does manu who is a female who does manifest the changes of nori disease. And so with the female in our population, she was born with um, light perception. However, she had a series of retinal detachments through life. And then in the end, in adulthood, ended up losing vision. And so it's, less, it's a sort of less severe phenotype. They're not born immediately blind, but they can develop. But I'm speaking about one case here. And it's always a question that comes up. And it's always a question that people want to know, like what percentage of females can, can be affected. But it's a really tough one to answer. But so far, we think it's less than 10%. Does that answer the question? OK, so if we move on to our results, first of all, about the hearing loss. In a few presentations this weekend, the figure of 30% hearing loss always comes up. But I think that most of us would agree that that doesn't really seem to really capture the experience of the community. In our sample, 62%, so about two thirds almost, of people had hearing loss. But again, I remind you that we have a small, we have a young sample. And so it's likely that even the 62% is an underestimate. The age of onset of hearing loss, so that was when hearing loss started, it ranged from four to 28, and the average was about 13, so 12.913. It's always really difficult because you can't predict it for any one person. So it's always, you know, you, you, you never know how much to take away from these figures, but it's just a ballpark, just a ballpark, you know, figure, a ballpark estimate. Six of the 22 reported ongoing issues with tinnitus, and 12 out of the 22 had troubling middle ear infections. And so middle ear infections are not a cause of hearing loss in Nori. We don't know that they're particularly any more common in people with Nori disease than they are or not. I mean, ear infections are very common anyway. And um, most ch children with Nori are being seen by the audiologists really frequently, and so it might be that these are being picked up more than they are for other children. But what they definitely do do is they definitely make it harder to start noticing when Nori hearing loss is taking place. This is a slide that was uh, put together by the NDF, and I'm going to explain this slide. This slide has got a series of bars of column it's a graph and it's got a series of columns and it shows you the age of all the people that we know in the uk who have got nori disease it goes from three months old to 34 years old the blue some of the columns are in blue and blue means no hearing loss and some of the columns are in yellow and yellow means there is hearing loss okay and what this shows is, as you would expect with age, more of the columns are going yellow than there are blue, which means that with age, more people are developing hearing loss. But you actually see that somewhere between 15 and 17 here, you over, older than 15, there are no people on, on this graph who are still blue, who do not have hearing loss, except this one blue one. Who Can anyone guess who that one is? Oh, no, 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 no. That one, is, this is the woman. Sorry, this is just the UK, yeah. So the one who is 28 and still has hearing is the woman. And as I said before, you would usually expect them to be less severe because even when they've switched off more of their healthy ones than their normal ones, they still have some healthy Xs left, 
And so you would um, expect that they would be slightly less severe. Okay? And these are just patients in the UK itself. So it's a bit of a, I mean, I think this is an important slide. It's quite a worry, I mean, I can understand that it would be quite a worrying slide, but it's also probably a very important slide because I think as long as that 30% number keeps being quoted, that just doesn't reflect what you guys are saying. Like every single person in the room mentioned hearing loss as an issue. Of course, many people mentioned other things, but there wasn't one person who said, I'm not bothered about hearing loss because I might be in the 70%, you know. So it's a really important issue, and we hope that when more and more of this research is published, those figures will be updated. This is just an audiogram, but you've had a great talk about audiograms today. This is a description of hearing loss by one of the people we um, interviewed. And to me, this was just a really interesting because I've never heard it described in such detail before. So it's described as these, of course, there's a gradual loss of hearing, but then also there are sometimes these sudden hearing loss episodes, which can be brought on by things like stress and cold or pressure, like sleeping on that ear for really long periods of time. Or even in some cases, people mentioned they thought foods were affecting this. And then this makes the, he the hearing deteriorate like more sort of sharply for about five days and then come back, but never as good as it used to be. And that these episodes are sometimes followed by some disruptive tinnitus for a few days. Does this sound familiar to people? Yeah. Anthony? That's your description. That's your description. You worked out. Yeah. <laughs> So I hope it sounds familiar to you, but everyone else, does it sound? I... <laughs> the slide that I've got up at the moment is a word cloud. Word clouds are when you uh, copy and paste lots and lots of text into a computer program, and then it makes, according to how frequent each word is, it will appear to be bigger. So on the screen, there's a graphic with words of different sizes showing how important or not important particular things were to people. And this was Wendy asked lots of people to email in just their prose, like detailed text descriptions of their hearing loss. The biggest word is hearing, which is obvious because it was about hearing loss. And then you've got aids, as in hearing aids, and loss. So all those three words are not surprising to anyone. But then actually the next biggest words are work and people. And both of those, work and people, are really talking about like the social functions of hearing. And we very much think that that's where, that's really what affects people most about hearing. I wanted to just read a um, description that someone sent it, as part of this. So I'm reading it just as they've written it. So they say, um, it's an adult male, and he says, I'm very socially awkward because of the hearing and the mental health, and so I tend to do a lot of stuff by text rather than by meeting people or by physically talking to people. I know that in a controlled environment and with the right support, I'm really sociable, but I would say that mental health is the worst because of what it is and because of feeling embarrassed because I can't hear which really is quite a powerful statement, and I think really talks about how isolating hearing loss can be and why it is so important. Moving on to vision now, we asked people as part of the survey whether they had any light perception at birth. In most cases, of course, this was answered by their parents. And of course, it's a subjective measure, so it depends on whether the parent felt that the child had any light perception at birth, which can sometimes be a little bit tricky to work out or to quantify. But nonetheless, six had light perception at birth. Three of those were the ones who had FEVR, or the one where we think they have FEVR. And three of them were Nori. And with those who had light perception at birth, and had a diagnosis of Nori, light perception was thought to be lost at around 18 months. The other concerns with vision are concerns that may be quite familiar to you, including glaucoma, cataracts, 
retinal detachments and corneal ulcerations. In the UK, um, this might be a little bit of a maybe cultural difference between America and the UK or just a practice difference, but in the UK, surgery tends to be very conservative and uh, it's done very much, assessed very much on a case-by-case -case basis. We did have patients who had surgery, but actually that wasn't surgery with the aim of maintaining light perception. It was surgery to sort things out like um, cataracts or tear ducts or glaucoma. And in one case in our survey, we had, the intention was to improve light perception, which it did temporarily. The other um, area which we, were, we asked about was vascular diseases. We asked about varicose veins, and varicose veins were, very, were quite common in the uh, population. Six of the men aged 16 to 55 had varicose veins, and one of them was really clear, and he said to me, please make sure you tell everybody to be really careful and to wear their TED stockings, you know, like those airplane stockings, when they start noticing the varicose veins developing, and also to maybe be assessed for them early because you don't know how they're going to progress. And one person had a non-healing foot ulcer. In terms of erectile dysfunction, which a few of you brought up as an important subject, of the 19 who were asked, one was female and two were not asked. Eight of them, so 42%, said that they had experienced erectile dysfunction. In five, these were post-pubertal, so they were men. And in three, they were young children where the mothers were saying that we're not noticing any of the morning erections or any of the just spontaneous activity that you would expect in a child of that age. There's not much written about the reasons for this, but you would just hypothesize that being a vascular condition, it's likely to be small vessel disease or arteriopathy. What we do know is that the management of erectile dysfunction in Norrie can sometimes be a bit more complicated. So it's not, it's, the two people who spoke about this in detail with me said that they didn't find much benefit from you know, Viagra or medication. Some people found having an implant or a penile prosthesis to be really, really helpful. And so we know that this is quite common and a concerning issue. We know that the management can be complex, but there is also a lot that can be done. But just if this is an issue, then get yourself to a urologist or to your family physician as soon as you can and just start that pathway of seeing what can work. And just be aware that it is common and that you may need to tell them that, you know, you also have nori and that this is a known thing and therefore it needs to be taken more seriously. Puberty and endocrine issues were brought up um, as something that the community wanted us to ask about. The, many people felt that there may be delayed puberty in nori. So delayed puberty is diagnosed when there's no growth of the testes in boys by the age of 14. The range of puberty onset in our sample was 11 to 18, with an average of 13.4, so the average was normal. Uh, four out of 12 had delayed puberty. None of them ended up needing growth hormone or medical intervention to get puberty started, but it would have definitely been helpful to have been assessed by an endocrinologist so that if this was needed, it could have been kicked in a bit more early. Two had undescended testes at birth, and in one case that needed surgery, and in one case that was, uh, it just descended spontaneously. So that's not out of keeping with normal population. Sip of water. Now, uh, the next slide is about neurology and development. So in the Smith et al. study, they, um, they mentioned a figure of approximately 10% for seizure disorder in Nori. In our population, out of the 21 people, one had had a seizure, and that was just a one-off seizure, which may have actually been a febrile seizure. So we didn't find the same 
you know, the same level of prevalence. But again, it's a small pop sample. It's a young sample. It's still worth keeping in mind, but it wasn't something that came out really strongly in our study. In terms of uh, cognitive impairment, so intellectual impairment after the age of one, so we don't really quote figures for before the age of one because it's quite difficult to work out. This was five out of 22 people. And developmental delay was found in eight out of 22. But it's really important to ensure that your pediatrician or whoever it is that you're going to see to assess development is experienced working with children with visual impairment because lots of this, the milestones can be different and it's really important to ensure that they're being seen by somebody who's specialized in this. Some families found a visual impairment de adapted developmental journal to be really helpful and I'll show you a slide of this next. And actually when I was researching for this, the PDF is available online. So it might be just worth you know, saving it onto your computer and using that alongside whatever you're using with your doctor. Autism is an issue that comes up in the literature. We found a very similar prevalence figure, 27% in our population, 27, which was similar to the figure that was found by Smith et al. But what I want to say is that of those, so that was six out of 22, four of them were highly functioning, independent, you know, they were um, in a few cases, they were managing to hold down jobs. One was even living by himself. And in two out of six was that severe autism or, you know, where they were dependent. So the autism figure needs to be broken down further, I think, to give parents a better understanding of this. This is the developmental journal. It's called Early Support, Helping Every Child Succeed Developmental Journal and it's available online, and the slide will be sent round. I've got a few slides here from the Developmental Vision Service at Great Ormond Street Hospital. So this is a service which is run by Dr. Ngozi, who's uh, one, of the, uh, um, one of the medical advisory board for the Norrie Disease Foundation. It's a clinic which is specifically designed to assess children with developmental delay who are also visually impaired. So I, I trained in pediatrics and I felt I thought I always thought I was quite confident doing developmental assessments. But actually when you go to this sort of clinic, you realize that it, you know, you really do need some specialized tools and some specialized equipment and some a real different understanding of the milestones that are acceptable before making any judgments about a child's development. So this is a multidisciplinary team which includes a pediatrician, a psychologist, an occupational therapist and a speech and language therapist. So they're able to do baseline developmental assessments, but they're also able to focus on any other disability or developmental consequences of chronic visual impairment. This slide is just a series of graphs, again from Dr. Ngozi, which just shows that visual impairment does impact on early development, including a language, a verbal comprehension, and sensory motor understanding. And that's why it's important to be seen, I think, by a specialist service if you are concerned and to ensure that you're being assessed and managed by somebody who understands visual impairment as a whole. They don't need to be specialized in Nori disease, but as long as they're specialized in visual impairment, that will really help. Okay, so now um, maybe some of our most important slides what should good care look like? So these slides were developed as a result of listening to what people wanted, but also asking Professor Maria about the genetic and the audiological perspective, asking Wendy about the family perspective, and asking Dr. Ngozi about the developmental perspective, and asking Mr. Henderson, who's our ophthalmologist, about the eyes. And so it's not a guideline, it's not published anywhere. I don't know how much clout it would have if you waved it in front of your doctor, but I think it's still an important thing to keep in mind. So in terms of diagnosis, initial diagnosis, we would recommend that people have gene panel testing rather than single gene test. What that means is sometimes if a doctor 
thinks a baby might have Norrie disease, they will send a test for N the NDP gene, which is all good and well if you have Norrie disease. But if you don't, that is much delaying the diagnostic process. So it's much more important to, or much more helpful to initially be tested for a whole panel, like a whole uh, you know, plethora of genes which are known to cause blindness from birth. And that will mean that a diagnosis is, is achieved a bit more quickly. Children need to be monitored by a multidisciplinary team, which includes specialists in developmental vision, um, audio vestibular physicians or audiologists, and um, those should be people who are experienced in dealing with children with dual sensory impairments. So I was still surprised to find that some of our families were going to an audiologist who was using like visual prompts during the examination, which is really unhelpful. So you need someone who is experienced in managing children with dual sensory impairments. We think that audiology testing should take place at birth. Uh, in the UK, we've got newborn hearing screening, which I'm sure is the same in other countries. It should take place again during early childhood, around the age of three, just before school entry, and annually thereafter. And additional testing, of course, based on any parental concerns or abnormal results. And audiological follow-up should be lifelong, as you expect. Uh, ophthalmology assessment should be, we think it should be at least once a year during childhood. And in adulthood, really, most people find that as like just having the doctor's number or knowing how to get referred and just being seen when it, as and when required is um, good enough for them. Again, in terms of surgery, that's a discussion to really have with your own doctors. In the UK, children are rarely offered eye surgery, and the decisions are made, again, with a, on a case-by-case -case basis. In terms of education, this is so important. Um, qualified teacher for the visually impaired or habilitation and mobilization services should be introduced really early, and we would hope between like zero to six months is the best time to get them started. Uh, dietitians and nutritional needs are important. So many children who are visually impaired can have trouble with food textures or with food diversion or with picky eating. And that's another thing that's useful to um, get some support on. Educational needs need to be assessed before starting school and see if the child needs any input in terms of occupational therapy for fine motor skills, physiotherapy for head and neck posture, I think yesterday there was a, a really useful discussion about the blind disease, and I think some of those um, would probably be best managed as early as possible. In terms of seeing an endocrinologist, we think that children would be, well, people, families would be well advised to see an endocrinologist at least once before puberty, so around the age of seven to nine, just so that they know them and they've got a good sort of baseline, and once again after puberty. And of course, if there are any delays there, then they would be seen more regularly. Um, vascular, so we, I already spoke about the recommendation about TED stockings if there are varicose veins, and those have to be reviewed if worsening. TED stockings aren't something that you should buy from the chemist and put on yourself. You should ensure that you're measured properly, and they can, if they're worn wrong, they can increase the risk of clots rather than reduce them. So it's worth seeing somebody about them. Erectile dysfunction should be discussed with the family doctor and appropriately escalated if it's not immediately being managed by the medications. And here, I say it's, it's like the most annoying thing a doctor can ever say, but maintain healthy weight, diet, and BMI. Some of you can see that I'm a hypocrite. But yeah. <laughs> um, we don't know about the cardiovascular risk in Norrie. Once. We don't know about the cardiovascular risk in Norrie. We don't know if have usually things like erectile dysfunction and vascular problems of the leg, usually they're associated with cardiovascular disease. Is it associated with Norrie? We don't know. Definitely worth being on the safe side until we've got an answer. Yes. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I can definitely give you the link to some published literature which shows the link, and that would be worth showing them. You have it already? Yeah. Yeah, it's so it's so difficult, especially if you're seeing a younger man. It is difficult sometimes to think of physical causes for that, but it is so important. And that's why I think hopefully our next step is going to be working on this, this leaflet, pamphlet. And we really hope it's going to be the kind of thing which you would be able to show to a doctor to try and prompt them to think further about, your, about whatever problems you're having. Uh, here's just a brief thing that people should have access to genetic counselors to discuss reproductive decisions if they're interested and mental health is really important so it's just an, an awareness that many people do feel socially isolated or anxious or depressed and it's important to see that as someone for that if you feel you need additional help in my I just wanted to put in the slide, which was really every time I left a family with Nori, I just learned so much. And I came across people with Nori who had degrees in journalism, live studio sound, music and drums, video and computer games, creative writing, American literature, public relations, communications. You know, they were working in journalism. We had someone in journalism in South Africa. We had people who were volunteers for the elderly. We had bankers, we had people working in the NHS. So much of the time we just focus on like all the negative and all the difficult stuff. But it's just knowing, like look at the people around you and just know that there is so much positive there. Um, I can see that my time is up. I'm just going to spend two minutes rushing through the hearing. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay. So this was an article uh, Wendy and I published on doctors, patients, and rare diseases, where we had 10 top tips for doctors working with people with rare diseases. And it was just things like, make sure you ask if they want their child to be present in the room. You know, if you're talking, if you have a child with Nori who's like five years old, and you're going to be talking about hearing loss, and that might not affect them for a few years, I think it's the parent's decision whether they want their child to be in the room at that time or not. Make sure that you're really honest with families where you don't know. Make sure you signpost them to at least the patient organization for that condition, because that will, that there will usually be people there who know so much more. And collaborate with others. You know, we, everyone knows so little, but, but together we know so much. And finally, um, a few slides about the hearing loss research that is taking place at Great Ormond Street Hospital at the moment. And so there's been a, a, a PhD and a postdoc which have been funded by Sparks and New Life, which are charities for medical research. And they're looking at restoration of hearing in a mouse model of Nori disease by viral gene therapy, which is the technology you heard about yesterday. Viral gene therapy for some genetic disorders is now possible, and there is some good, there are some good reasons why it should be hopeful in Nori. These include the fact that the Nori gene is very small and it can fit in a virus. The other thing is that hearing loss is progressive and it doesn't start straight away, so you may have some time to get in there. And finally, the inner ear is very small anat anatomically. It's not like the lungs. And so you'd only need a small amount of virus needed to get into the inner ear. We have... We said we have the one PhD, the one postdoc uh, who has six months remaining and another postdoc who's got 12 months and is about to start. And they're all working on the mouse model of Nori. The questions that we want to answer are, when does the hearing loss start in the Nori mouse? Is the inner ear ever normal? So we know that young children may not have hearing loss at that moment, but do we, are we sure that their inner ears are normal to start with? Which parts of the inner ear are affected? So we know about the stria vascularis, and we've heard about that a lot. But how about the other parts of the ear? You know, how about the hair cells, the blood supply, neurons, or is it all of these? And how can we tell if we're successful in the mouse or in the human, other than by measuring hearing over time? Because we know that measuring hearing over time is going to take years and years to start getting our results. 
these are the key, key questions. So, as I said, how and when does the cochlear pathology start and progress? How and when can we intervene to try and prevent the hearing loss? These are all the, the, this is a little flow chart which shows us the steps. So we've got the Norrie disease mouse, and then we've got our assays, which are, are our ways of measuring hearing loss. So these include imaging, so taking scans, as well as electrophysiology, which are clever measurements to see how chemicals move across cell membranes and how that, how that um, is you know, related to hearing. And then we need to also, the other arm of this flow chart is intervention. So how do we develop the virus that will uh, hold the gene, and how will we deliver the virus to the correct place? So an important thing to say is that there's no, there are no results we can share today, but if and when, not if, when there are results, you will be the first people to know. You know, we're, we're not working on this on a commercial basis. We're not interested in keeping anything to ourselves. And as long as you keep connected with the NDA or the NDA and the NDA and the NDF also have a good relationship, as long as you're connected as part of these patient groups, you will hear about the research in due course. So my final slide is just to thank the Norrie Disease Association for having us, the Norrie Disease Foundation for all their support with our work, and most importantly for all the patients and the families who took part in this research. In the beginning, I used to consent them for like 45 minutes, and it was actually taking two hours. So everyone was so generous with their time, and I really, really thank everyone for being a part of this, and I hope that we'll be able to continue this relationship. Thank you. So I'm sure we have lots of questions. I'm going to make a... a a brief announcement that we're going to try to roll as quickly into the next speaker so um, because it's our last day and we want to make sure we have enough time for the breakout session. So we're going to do two questions and then Amina is going to be here yeah. during the breakout session and um, and she'll be able to answer questions, um, you know, then too, yeah. correct? Okay. Okay. So we're going to get set up for the next speaker while we take some questions and I'm going to come back here. The survey is really, really important, but uh, there's a way people outside the UK can take it and, uh, well, as long as, as more people that will join the survey and take the survey, there'll be more, uh, more knowledge and yeah. more, there's a way we can join that. Thank you so much for that question. So the question was, um, is there a way for people outside the UK to be involved in the survey? So I think just because of the, I told you how complicated it was to get the ethical clearance for the study. It had to, it was, in the beginning, it was very much limited to the UK, and then we um, allowed some European cases to be included as well. I think that, if I'm correct, the Norrie Disease Association said that they have a survey online. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone here to answer that? Yeah? Mark? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're, you've done one of these surveys, be it the NDA or the NDF, the hope is that you will be known about, your family will be known about and located. And in the future, if there was ever sort of a clinical trial or anything which was open to global patients, we would know where to find you. Mm -hmm.
Um, in some of my reading about X-Link's disorders, the, there seems to be in the literature some sort of suggestion that as generations continue on and in a family, that mutation is expressed. Um, as it moves through the generations, the phenotype seems to be more severe. Did you notice evidence of that in your, um, your study or even anecdotally in the patients that you've seen? Hmm. Our study definitely wasn't big enough to answer that question and we actually only had one like kinship like that so the grandfather and the grandson other than that we didn't have any we didn't have many generations of a particular family to look at so I can't really answer like that medically, question though, in the even in the in like amongst the medical community is that a an understood or thought thing or am I just reading it's out of date something research that I've come across very frequently X-linked disorders becoming more severe as generations go on. But what I can say is different things happen. So firstly, technology is improving, diagnostics are improving. So you're always going to be picking up more things than you were picking up a few generations ago. That's one thing. And the other thing is that we really don't understand very much about all these gene modulators. So as I said, you can have a genetic change but there can be lots of other genes that affect the function of that gene. And could it be that as your family is, as your, you know, as the generations are passing with the introduction of new family members or new genes in the, to that gene pool, things like that are happening. Yeah, but nothing that I've come across specifically about Nori. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, and I'm here. I'm here till the okay. end. And so. we gr greatly appreciate you traveling all this way to share this. I'm really happy to be here. Thank okay. you. All right, Mark, are we ready to, yeah, okay, thank you.